Brilliant. Well, we're all ready to kick off now um, with today's Open Democracy um, webinar in which we're asking, I think, what I think is a very important question. Is the UK's reputation management industry destroying journalism? And I've been the head of investigations here at Open Democracy for a good length of time. And the UK's reputation management industry, which in some ways is a polite term to describe what is effectively an entire nexus of consultancies, lobbyists, and primarily lawyers who are really, whose job it is to stop people like me, people like my colleagues, both in the UK and around the world from publishing stories. Here at Open Democracy, you know, legal threats, sadly, are a daily part of times, at least a weekly part of our life and the stories that we do. We're so focused on issues around transparency, corruption, human rights. These are often the kind of stories that there's an entire industry out there trying to stop. And it's remarkable. It's a, probably in many ways, the size and scale, the amount of money that goes into the industry that is trying to public interest journalism, I'd say it's probably might be bigger than the size of public, the public industry, um, interest journalism industry itself. And Open Democracy, we've, we've had this. And often as journalists, we don't talk about this. It's a kind of part of our life that we really often don't talk about. And we did break cover in Open Democracy a few months ago. We told a story of how the now De Democratic Unionist Party leader, Jeffrey Donaldson, and his brother attempted to sue us a few years ago. And, and the difficulties it placed us and the huge financial perils it placed us. You know, and eventually, even though that case never went to court, it was never, the papers were never served, you know, no judgment was ever found against us. It still cost us huge amounts of time and money as well. And this is really the experience I think you're going to hear a lot about today, that often it's not about a case coming to trial. It's not about it's not about a journalist been found to have done something wrong. It's about an entire industry that exists to try and stymie journalism. And I think it's a really important issue. And I think it's one of these issues that so often doesn't get the kind of interrogation it deserves. I'm really lucky to be joined here today by a panel that I think are incredibly well um, placed to interrogate this is issue in, um, you know, in, as I say, in the way I think it really does need to be interrogated. We have uh, Rebecca Vincent, who's a director of campaigns um, at RSF. Re uh, Rebecca is a human rights campaigner, free expression advocate, and a former diplomat with 15 years of NGO and diplomatic service. And at RSF, you know, Rebecca and her colleagues are really trying to shine a spotlight on the challenges that are facing journalists, um, not just in the UK, but around the world. We're also going to be joined today by um, Claire uh, Rucastle brown who's an investigative journalist and the editor of the Sarawak Report. And she has her own harrowing experiences of having to deal with this type of these kind of lit litigious reputation management, trying to stop investigative journalism. And last but not least, we have Susan Coftry, who's the project director at the Foreign Policy Centre and has written extensively on uh, a number of these issues, most recently in Open Democracy, talking about these challenges. And the big thing you will hear about today a lot is a thing called SLAP, which sounds, you know, um, as, as the name suggests, is quite a, a, a violent, uh, a violent uh, noun. And, and what that means is it's strategic lawsuits against public participation. As you can see, I have to read it because I, it's a word I use all the time, slap, but I don't always uh, have it to hand in terms of what exactly it means. I wanted to start um, by asking you, Susan, could you explain like what is slap and you know, where does this term come from? Um, um, is it the kind of thing we are seeing more of? Thanks, Peter, and thanks very much for hosting this discussion. Um, I've heard a few people question whether the acronym SLAP came first or the sort of phrase around it. Um, so strategic litigation against public participation was originally a kind of founded as a concept in the US, uh, but I would say it's come increasingly to prominence uh, in Europe and the UK in light of um, the murder uh, or the assassination of uh, Daphne Caruana Galizia, who was an investigative journalist in Malta, who at the time of her murder in October 2017 had upwards of 47 
open libel cases against her. And this sort of shed new light on uh, this being the type of threat that journalists are, investigative journalists are experiencing alongside clearly other forms of harassment um, and very sadly in, in, in Daphne's case, of course, murder. Um, and so what it speaks to is basically a, a legal uh, threats being used as a tool to harass and intimidate journalists and uh, vexatiously so. So not uh, with intent uh, to necessarily, you know, uh, genuinely uh, resolve a grievance that you have, but actually try to suppress information by using legal intimidation. And common hallmarks are that there's sort of an inequality of arms. Um, they're often brought by people who have uh, vast, uh, you know, resources and wealth that they can throw at these services, as you say, that that's not just lawyers, also sort of PR and reputation management services. Um, and they hound journalists uh, with letters and with legal threats. And sometimes they don't progress. Um, you know, they don't progress even to real uh, letters of, you know, pre-claim action letters. It, it can just start with, with sort of threats uh, informally uh, and escalate. And um, what I would say is, the research I'm doing at the Prime Policy Centre, which is under a project called Unsafe for Scrutiny, we're looking particularly at journalists who are investigating financial crime and corruption and how um, you know those that they're investigating usually do have deep pockets um, and how they use uh, legal intimidation and slaps as a way to suppress in, you know, any kind of public scrutiny into their wrongdoing. Um, so that's sort of the it in a nutshell, maybe to kick us off. And Rebecca, I might bring you in here now to just, if you wanted to talk about, like, you know, the journalistic kind of experience of this, you know, what, what's it like for journalists? And is this something that, you know, that they're feeling more and more? Um, yes, but also there's part of this is that we now know more about it, right? And so in recent years, I think, um, and in fact, my own entry point into SLAP was really not even directly working on kind of legal threats. It was, I, I, I stumbled into it in my work campaigning on the case of a journalist who was assassinated in Malta, Daphne Caruana Galizia. Um, Malta was a great example of, of how um, threats such as, as these actually impact the broader press freedom climate in any given country or, or transnationally, because what we saw was a situation um, where the independent media were systematically silenced on an issue at, at the time that was related to Palazzo's bank, right? Um, Daphne Caruana Galizia refused to be silenced and she was kind of left more isolated because of that. She was speaking out. Um, but in the aftermath of her assassination, I think a lot of our organizations, free expression organizations, started to look into this in a more kind of campaigny way. This has traditionally been more the area of lawyers. So, you know, Suze has mentioned that the, um, the acronym is a bit jargony. It is, in fact. And, and in fact, I'm often the non-journalist in a room of journalists and the non-lawyer in a room of lawyers. But when you look at what it really is, it's abuse of the law to silence public participation, whether that's journalism, whether that's international um, activism, whether like, climate change campaigners, for example, have faced this often. We see it in academia now, now that we know more about it and can piece it together. Um, but very what hap often what happens to, to, to journalists is um, they are isolated. They are intentionally pursued in a way that singles them out, that leaves them at greater risk. Um, it's very often combined with other types of threats. And that's a real, that's a point I really want to make is that we cannot just look at this as a compartmentalized issue in its own silo. Very often the same journalists who are facing these types of threats are also facing extensive online abuse, um, threats of violence and other things. So this is just part of a climate, part of building pressure very often against individuals. And what, what has happened really as well is that um, there's been kind of a, a culture of secrecy around all of this because this is not new and in fact lawyers have known this for years we're just sort of sort of starting to uh to become more aware of it in, in terms of how it impacts our work but media lawyers have certainly been aware of this for years and in fact some of the bigger media outlets have very often complied with such threats that's why they're effective when everybody sort of just uh complies kind of quietly deals with this doesn't expose it for what it is which is a, an attempt to silence critical reporting then it's allowed to exacerbate and then when it is um, used against journalists who don't have that type of support we can see the impact on them being even more significant 
Um, a really good example is the case of Carol Cudwallader here in the UK, um, where Erin Banks went after her, not for reporting that she had done in The Guardian and The Observer, although she it was speaking about the same things that had been uh, published through those outlets. He went after her specifically for something she said in a TED talk and something she tweeted, and that really left her more vulnerable. And we see this repeated far too often. Um, but very often it's it's these these individual journalists, these really scrappy individuals, very often women, I have to say, including Claire, who, who I know is um, is going to share a bit about her experience in a minute, that are the ones fighting. What we need to see, I think, is um, greater solidarity among the media community in general and exposing the shedding light on it and fighting back together. Because one thing we've also seen is when you when you call it out, sometimes you can call their bluff. And very often that is enough to sort of diffuse the situation. Not always, but it can happen. And I've seen that. Um, happen even very recently in Malta where where this still remains a big issue. Thanks Rebecca and one of the things I've always been really struck with this is you know like working with someone like Open Democracy like when someone threatens us legally we are really always trying to push as far as we can go and to get our stories out as much as we can but I, I've worked in traditional newsrooms often just a single legal letter from somebody is enough to stop a story especially in smaller outlets you know I, I've worked in you know regional press and places like that the very threat of legal action will often be enough to stop a story unless there's a really big impetus behind it and I think it's really underappreciated just how effective the, some of these issues are there are some of these threats can be as well like there's and there's a there's a bit of an omerta around it when it comes to journalists too journalists don't really want to talk about how legal threats have stopped them doing stuff you know it's especially in smaller newsrooms in environments where you know um publishers would they don't want to risk going to court they don't want to risk the, the expense of going to court they don't want to risk any of that so often they will 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 just you know they will either pay up they'll settle out of court even if they're, they believe they're in the right or, or they will just not publish stories when they send the right to reply letter in and the letter comes back so just so people know in journalism if we're doing an investigation if we're doing any story we're going to make an allegation about somebody we kind of we we pretty much have to send them what's called a right of reply. So we, we send them a letter, we send them an email detailing the things that we're going to say about them, the allegations we have, and giving them a chance to respond. It's responsible journalism. It's important to give other people their side of the story. But what can sometimes happen is you, you get a legal letter back, and that often happens. We, I was just dealing with one the other day, a 15, 20-page legal letter. But very often the very threat at the end of that legal letter which might be we're going to sue you if you publish can be enough to stop it especially you know journalists then go to their editor with that letter the editor sees it and goes well, i'm not you know i've got a lot on my plate i'm not going to deal with this this is a huge amount of work and that often goes unsaid there's a kind of there's a chilling effect that exists across journalism and at open democracy we are really trying i think it's one of the things i've been so one of the reasons i've been so kind of uh pleased to work here is there's an active attempt not to, to, to kind of you know to, to fight against it and I, I agree with Reginald was just saying there leads to a lot of self-censorship self and you see that a lot there's a concern amongst journalists you self-censor and that's one of the reasons why I think I, we're, I'm so pleased that, that Claire is here for, um, who's you know done fantastic reporting and in really difficult circumstances Claire I wonder if you can can you tell us a little bit about the work you do and your own experiences of, of this kind of thing this kind of slap uh, attack well, I think, thank you. And please let me know if there's an issue with my internet connection. I'm, I'm having a holiday in Spain, I have to admit. <laughs> um, but um, yes, I mean, everything all of you have said so far um, rings so true. I, I spent most of my professional life working in big newsrooms, um, trying to persuade lawyers to risk uh, doing investigative stories, which they'd really rather you didn't. Or if you were gonna expose someone, go and do it to someone who can't fight back, please. Um, so I, I was sort of liberated away when I when I went off on my own, um, decided to use the internet in my way, myself, start up a blog and go after some genuine, important, unreported corruption stories. Um, and I found that in that capacity, I've been able to do stories, um, you know, most recently, like the one MDB scandal, the biggest uh, kleptocracy seizure that the United States has, has recently uh, undergone. Um, these stories I would not have been able to do 
in a normal newsroom. And in fact, you know, I've had to try and work because the stories were so big, because, you know, I was dealing with prime ministers, major banks like Goldman Sachs and huge institutions and wealthy people. I was approaching uh, larger news organizations to try and get their backing and support. And it was incredibly hard most of the time because, uh, you know, for example, the very first story I did, um, which was about this uh, fraudster um, who, who stole billions from the Malaysian people called Joe Lowe, We'd, I, I got the Sunday Times, we worked together and, and they brought out a story. And, and frankly, they, they, ter- they said, we've had six of the top legal for- firms in London have got onto us, threatening us left, right and centre, calling you a madman, politically motivated and all the rest. We're probably not going to come back to this story. It's costing us enough as it is. And, and that's the problem, you know. So you have the weird situation where it's the Maria races of this world, you know, um, people like myself, who are determined to stand up against this kind of it's not satisfactory at all. Um, and I think part of the problem actually goes back to um, the pre-action protocol that you mentioned. It seems like a really good idea. I was in the House of Lords, actually, as a reporter when the whole thing was argued and put through. And it was in the name of, you know, the weak target of of vile newsrooms. You know, this was why the pre-action protocol was brought in to prevent cases going too far. And what it's actually done is force news organizations to respond to the slightest, you know, to every uh, rebuttal. You, you have to keep bending over backwards. And if someone's got a lot of money, what they'll do is basically force you to keep engaging expensively um, until you go away. And that has been refined into the reputation laundering industry. So they're not only just pushing you away, uh, but you know, if you get onto them, these super wealthy people, but they're coming back, you know, usually a year later when they realize they need to clean the internet from their, you know, the embarrassing but true story that affected them. And they'll come back um, and uh, start trying to harass you and cost you money so that you, you clean their name out of things. And I've been the target of an awful lot of that. Um, people think that they can, you know, they can bully me into just getting their name out of it. And, and there are You know, it's such a lucrative business. You've got dozens of law firms now, um, particularly in the UK, vying for these rich clients uh, for this work. It's it's blatant and shameless if you look at the advertising of these law firms, you know, you know, offering to be the concierges, the the reputation concierges of ultra high net worth individuals. It's really disgusting. And I I do think actually it's reached a pass where it's it's actually for the law profession need to look at this abuse and clean up their house. I I think that's part of the solution to this problem. Thank you very much, Claire. And I think that's, you know, it's the points you raise, I see Nick Williams here as well ask, talking about reputation laundering and saying that's that's the best term for this. I, I think it's a very effective term. I was actually talking to somebody, uh, uh, actually a, a political donor, a conservative political donor the other day, uh, who uh, was was talking to me about some work we'd done recently and he was saying like how he was commending in the work and I was talking about the importance of reputa- what's happening with reputation laundering and even he was saying, yeah, that's a really good word. That's kind of what this is, isn't it? I was like, yeah, it is. And I think there's a real need to kind of call a spade a spade with this stuff as well. Because what you are seeing is, it's, it is about trying, to, as you say, you know, we've got Catherine Belton's case going through the courts at the moment, which is really shocking. This is a, you know, a facia journalist, former FT journalist, wrote a book, um, I think it's Putin's People, you know, very in, a very in-depth account of what's happening uh, in, in the inner circle. And a number of senior uh, Russian um, um, oligarchs, uh, uh, including, I'm pretty sure, uh, Roman Abramovich, and correct me if I'm wrong, are pursuing her through the courts. Um, and one thing that really strikes me about this, I don't, you know, is how often London is used as the court venue for this, for cases that have nothing, that have no ostensible connection uh, to, to the UK. I'm thinking, for example, the great investigative journalist Paul Radu, you know, who's a Romanian citizen working for a US outlet, being brought to court by an Azeri MP. Uh, in in London, which seem to have no connection with the jurisdiction, I wonder if we could, you know, what's happening with that? Why is why is London becoming the global capital of this sort of reputation laundering? Um, Susan. Well, I think there's sort of 
two sides to that. I mean, one, first of all, is the attractiveness of the UK as a jurisdiction in which to put a legal threat, um, because defending one is is very hard um, and very long and very expensive. So the UK legal system sets a very high bar and um, just getting a threat from a UK uh, law firm um, is <laughs> more threatening than you might get from another jurisdiction. Um, so there's that side of it. And then there's also the side where it's possible in the UK to establish a reputation here relatively easily. I mean, there were reforms to the English and Welsh uh, libel laws back in 2013 that were supposed to kind of cut down on libel tourism, but I think they kind of forgot to take into account that um, if you're wealthy enough, it's very easy to set up a reputation here, to buy property here, to, um, to set up a business here. Um, and we also know that the UK, especially through, thanks to these uh, great investigative journal, you know, journalistic investigations done by OCCRP uh, and others, that um, the UK is uh, being misused. Its, its, its legal and financial systems are misused for um, illicit flows of, of dirty money. And, and therefore, once it's here, it can also be used uh, to... Um, you know, for, for services that can suppress uh, investigations into that wrongdoing. So it's sort of a, a very um, horrible <laughs> symbiotic relationship. And um, and so in terms of uh, Paul's case, um, he, yes, is a Romanian uh, journalist and he was sued again personally. And that's another hallmark often of these types of legal threats is that the journalist is also isolated as an individual. And that is possible in the UK. Um, as well as you know the publisher or, or the news outlet, um, and he was. Uh, I mean, OC, OCCLP are, are registered in the US, and and the Azerbaijani MP was able to say that he, uh, having property in London, um, despite being an active you know MP in, in Azerbaijan, had a reputation to defend here, and enough um, you know articles uh, relating to the Azerbaijani laundromat were opened in, in London. So, you know, but if everything's online, we will consume the news online these days, that part is not very uh, difficult. I mean, another kind of really clear case with this is, is an ongoing case with a business news publication called Realted. It's a Swedish um, business uh, publication published in Sweden, in Swedish, um, but of course, you know, available online. And um, a couple of investigative journalists there last year were looking into the business dealings of a Swedish businessman who's domiciled in Monaco. And um, he didn't uh, respond well to that and decided to sue them in the UK, um, despite you know, the fact that he could have taken legal action in Sweden, but uh, it's my understanding that there he wouldn't have been able to um, take action against them as individuals. And due to the Swedish system, there would have been more of a cost capping and they would have had to go through a regulatory process as opposed to just going straight to, to legal threats. Um, and uh, currently that case is, is, is ongoing. And, you know, that's been, it was filed just before Christmas. So, you know, six months uh, plus already, these journalists um, have been waiting. And something similar to, as you kind of spoke to at the beginning, uh, Peter, about the cases that you, know, you face, is this kind of you know, <laughs> waiting for things to happen and the psychological toll and the resources that takes on and diverts you away from actually what, you know, you're supposed to be doing. Um, and so, yeah. Yes, having personally experienced that the personal legal, uh, the personal threat, uh, to, a libel threat, which is really, you know, it's happened a number of times where they will, you know, you get a libel letter, not just addressed to the organization you work for, but also addressed to you personally. And that seems to be, it's something that's only happened to me in the last few years. And, and, you know, and I have to say, personally, it's a very stressful thing to happen. Like, it's very stressful. Like, you know, you can find out someone's financial affairs quite easily. You can find out if they own a house. It's not hard to do. I can find out if anybody, you know. Like, and that is public records, really. And so it's not hard, you know, it's it's not hard to start to see how things could get very, very different, you know, how your own personal like life could be massively affected by it. And it's, you know, I think it's kind of probably a slightly undertold story that the psychological toll that that can take on people. Um, just taking taking back this a bit more, this kind of whole libel tourism aspect, um, Rebecca, like, you know, is this something do you, you know, what, to what extent do you feel like this is something that is affecting the kind of journalism that we're seeing being done? Do you feel like this is something that is actually kind of having a real impact on, on what, what's covered and what's not being covered? 
Absolutely. And you have to uncover pockets of it because it might not even be obvious from here, because, of course, London law firms are doing this in, in other countries around the world. And so you have to then find country experts that can see it clearly for what it is. And the British public is, is largely unaware what, what these firms are doing, even if, even if we kind of know about it. There's not really enough naming and shaming here. So maybe we should name a few of these guys while we're at it. Mishkan Dereya, Carter Rock, Shillings. I mean, it's the same maybe three to five firms that come up in so many of these cases. And you can go to a country like Malta, like Malaysia, and really see the impact that it's having on the ground. So you've talked about the, the personal kind of impact of opening these letters. So imagine if you're like a, a small independent outlet, maybe two or three staff, maybe at actually the finances are connected to your own home and you get this letter you know on London you know a big London law firm on the letterhead and it says private and confidential and it's like you must you know <laughs> take down every story about this specific topic this specific individual um most people especially if nobody's talking about it if they don't feel any solidarity for others most people would simply comply because um, at the end of the day, like you need somewhere to live, you need to be able to sort of live your life and do other reporting. But the impact is it can make certain topics, certain companies, certain people almost untouchable. And somebody said in the chat um, a little bit earlier that, it, you know, it, it results in self-censorship. Absolutely. And as any of us who work in free expression know, that's that's really probably the most serious obstacle to free expression around the world is self-censorship because it's so difficult to measure, to pinpoint and to counter because it's, you know, it's all these influences slap and other other ways that makes us um, not cross certain lines. And so absolutely it impacts the climate in many countries around the world. I just want to, I think that the global aspect of this is something that maybe isn't always appreciated too, because we're used to seeing stories in the press to do with, you know, to do with the, um, to do with like kind of events in Britain, like probably the most famous libel trial in recent years was the Johnny Depp trial with, with the Sun, you know, and it feels in some ways like the days of big libel trials are not as big a thing. So I think the casual kind of uh, passing interest in current affairs might go, oh, it's not that big a thing. You know, there was defamation reform, much needed defamation reform in England and Wales, hasn't gone far enough, but compared to here in Scotland, and it's particularly compared to Northern Ireland, it is better than it was with a serious harm test. So you might go, actually, it's not a big issue. But I think the global aspect of this, which you mentioned there, Rebecca, is, is a really, really important one, that this is something that's happening in London that's having a global impact. And Claire, I wonder if you could speak a bit more about, like, what does that look like? Is somebody, say, reporting from, you know, in the in, from somewhere like Sarawak, like the impact that has on the story as you can tell globally? Well, I think the point you made, um, you know, 98% of libel cases go nowhere near a judgment. Um, you know, I lost my pension um, and any spare money I had <laughs> over a case that was never going to come to judgment and the guy pulled out. Uh, but, you know, it, in order to stand to stand my ground, I, you know, I, 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 I was impoverished. Um, it's a huge, huge, um, uh, you know, um, attack on a journalist. Um, I mean, I've had death threats. I've had people following me around. I've had all the sort of intimidation that you meant, social media attacks and, and so on, but nothing more, you know, visceral than the threat of losing the house over your children's heads. And, you know, I had two teenage boys. I mean, their response, every time there's an official looking letter that comes through our letterbox, both my kids, they go white, you know, mum, could this be another <laughs> letter, you know? And, and indeed we've had a lot of trauma um, as a result of these, these sorts of, um, you know, kind of attacks on your very well being. Um, and the nature of these letters, I, you know, you have to laugh. I, I, you're right, they're very effective. These guys are vicious. You know, you're, we, we are quite restrained in our reporting. Clearly, it's, you don't, you know, it's, it's only civilized to be so, and you tend to be very restrained in what you say. These lawyers write private and confidential at the top of an unrequi unrequested letter and abuse you for 10 pages. You know, they abuse your intentions, they abuse your sanity, they abuse your honesty. Um, and then they say, well, you know, we're saying all these things and, um, you know, you can't, you can't tell anyone we said it. <laughs> um, so, it, you know, and, and they, they, most times, I mean, they don't get away with it with, with me anymore because I've, I've had so many of these letters and I know the game. But time and again, I've seen it being very effective against individuals who are trying to do the right thing in the public interest. They're scared off. It's deliberate and it's an abuse um, and it's very unattractive and it should be dealt with. 
Yes, I think that is quite remarkable. You get these letters. I just had one the other day, which just says, you know, like, you're not allowed to say any of this thing in public to anybody. Here's private and confidential. And like, Why? Like, where, I've never signed up to anything saying this. You know, it's it's it, it quite remarkable. As you say, it's, it's you know, and we're looking, you know, you often you have to work with a lawyer too to help you with some of this stuff or you know or you are like at times with a small organization like us we have to try and find someone to help us or you're doing it yourself and it's really having to sit down painstakingly it's happened to me many times with a 10 page legal letter and at the end of it actually there's nothing in it you know there's 10 pages but it's empty it's 10 pages of smoke and mirrors and waffle and well, I think there's that's usually you, there's usually a um an objective and the objective is usually to get you to do something uh, that has absolutely nothing to do with the content of the letter. So there will be endless complaints that you've somehow breached somebody's privacy or data or that you've exaggerated, you know, what they did or that you used a word that was totally inappropriate for what they did. And, you know, they're going to come at you in different directions. But you usually get to the meat of it round about, you know, the penultimate paragraph, which tends to be, but of course, you know, although we could destroy you over these ghastly things that you've done in your malicious ways, um, were you to remove my client's name from all the um, articles uh, to do with this crime in which he was factually involved, um, we will, we will um, happily drop all, uh, all, of, all of these matters. Um, you, you know, it, it, the, the blackmail has, is often so blatant. In one case, um, in order to get someone off my back and on my lawyer's advice, which I, I regretted and continue to because it only encourages them to come back, I did comply with someone. Um, and then they took their judgment. They suddenly realized that they, they could clear all their name out of the British and European media. But when they got to the States, where a lot of my work had been reproduced online, um, you know, they were given two fingers by the various organizations because there are more protections um, in the United States against uh, these kind of defamation issues. So what did the lawyers do? They came back and they said, um, actually, you know, we're going to come back and have another go at you here on these things. Oh, unless you can give us a bit of help on copyright, because if you give us copyright, then we can go back to the United States and get them to take it down that way. So, I mean, you know, they are in the game of blackmail, which fortunately my lawyer was able to remind them <laughs> and that their, um, you know, that their privilege did not extend to crime um, and they backed off. But, you know, that's, you know, that's how bad these outfits are and how badly they behave. And you ha we have to stand up to it. Peter, maybe... I Sorry. Sorry, just to comment on that. Maybe it's yeah. worth it from a practical perspective, just saying very explicitly, if you get one of these letters, you can do whatever you want with it. It belongs to you. It doesn't matter if it's marked private and confidential. And ideally, you know, if you're a journalist, especially not attached to Big Outlet, ideally you can find a way to get some legal advice. There's some great organizations out there that are resources. Um, for example, the Media Legal Defense Initiative. There's others that we, you know, organizations like ours can try to connect you with. Um, Susan and I are involved in a big anti-slap coalition of NGOs here in the UK. So there's places to get advice, but you can do what you want with your letter. Um, we work uh, closely with the Shift News in Malta and Caroline Muscat there has published every single threatening letter she's ever received. She's just published it. And to date, none of them have actually followed through with a suit. So it is quite possible to call someone's bluff. But again, I would encourage anybody that can to get, you know, specific legal advice from their situation. And thank you very much. I would, I, yeah, I would, I would, I would endorse both the legal advice, but also thinking about the reality. Like these are unsolicited letters, and some of the things they will say to you are actually like, they, as Claire says, you would have these expensive lawyers basically traducing you completely and claiming that you've done all sorts of things that you have not done. And it's, it is, it's, it is quite remarkable when, when you're involved in it. But I have seen it work. You know, firsthand. I remember I had. You know, when I was working for a major broadcaster, uh, we went out to Bosnia and made a, 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 what was to be a 10 minute long film about environment, about environmental corruption. Um, we were there, spent a lot of, you know, a lot of money on this. A lot of work went into it. And uh, it was, uh, I can't remember if it was Shillings or Mishkan, but one of the big law firms, the first letter that went in and they just sunk their teeth in and people back down. Like people will back down. It's a real problem. This is. This is exactly the kind of thing that people will back down on. Um, and there's a really interesting point raised there, I see, by, by Nick Williams as well, about privacy and data protection as the next frontier of slap actions. We I've already started to see this too. And I think what Nick probably means by that, and he might correct me if I'm wrong, is that 
people are claiming that's their personal data stuff that you would never think of as personal data a photograph of somebody things like that they're claiming no that's personal data and i i, I actually unfortunately can start to see that too where there's an opportunity where you're going no that's that that's my personal data so that becomes the figure you know so it's less about the, what you said about me is untrue but you've got my personal data there which in some respects actually was what um uh, Benny Steinmetz tried to do with Global Witness back in the day, which was a very famous case, and he tried to he tried to say that they had his personal data. Uh, thankfully, they, they won that case in the end. But I wanted to bring then what what can we do about this? You know, this is a big problem. We can see it's a problem. What what can be done, Susan? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I think the first step is just acknowledging that it's there. Um, I mean, you mentioned, Peter, that um, people and journalists talk about it amongst themselves, um, in-house media lawyers um, who deal with these letters regularly. I mean, I think there has been sort of historically, I think, as Rebecca alluded to as well, a kind of fear of, of speaking out about it. Um, but actually, sometimes when you do, you can actually call people's bluff. And, um, and by kind of speaking out about it, you're also creating space for others to speak out about their experiences and for someone to recognize, particularly, you know, someone who's not as well resourced, doesn't have uh, in-house media council, maybe isn't in the UK, would be more intimidated by receiving a legal letter from, from here. They can see ah others have received these letters too I can get legal advice I can you know not just automatically comply or or, or you know maybe have that initial response as you say these letters can make for very awful and scary reading even when you're not the person who's subject to them um, so you know, uh, you know I think that is a great first step um, second of all I think when it comes specifically to the UK um, we really need to look at the regulatory and uh, legal uh, systems that help enable this and the enablers within it. Um, as I think we mentioned, there's been uh, kind of already a lot of work in Europe, um, uh, organizations that have come together to um, put forward a model EU directive on anti-slap. Um, obviously, of course, we would not be party to that, um, but there are other initiatives and um, through the um, UK anti-slap uh, coalition that Rebecca mentioned that um, myself, her and other, many other organizations, including not just freedom of expression and media, you know, freedom organizations, but anti-corruption, transparency, whistleblowing, um, you know, writing organizations, because you realize that this isn't just about journalists, you know, it, the term itself is against any kind of public participation and people speaking up on issues. And um, so, uh, yeah, I think we need to look at the laws. Um, there is obviously libel laws that have been mentioned a lot, but Nick's, Nick's right, they're not the only ones and privacy and, and copyright um, and maybe there needs to be something like an anti-slap law here that might encompass some of that um, and then secondly you know the regulation so um, you know we're familiar with the concept of things wrongdoing only kind of blooming in darkness and unfortunately these law firms um, are rarely covered I mean we, they then they're part of a hidden process they send out the letters um, and, you know, if, especially if it doesn't go to court, you, you don't hear anything about them at all. Uh, and they can write these letters and they can write them how they like. Um, and so I think there does need to be more attention to what's happening um, and uh, legal uh, you know, regulators looking into that. And, and PR firms and reputation companies that aren't subject to any regulation. Um, and we should be really kind of pushing, particularly on the um, anti-corruption side, you know, how, how, how are these being funded? And particularly if it's investigations into those who are accused of wrongdoing, shouldn't there be an extra kind of check there to, to make sure that these services aren't actually in fact being paid for by illicit gains, uh, which would go against, you know, the Proceeds of Crime Act and things like that. So it's also about enforcement of things that are already there, just as much as it is about um, looking at, you know, new ways to regulate and legislate. There's an interesting question here from Owen O'Dell, who I think is in Kerry, the lucky man. And he's saying, um, you know, that we're wait, going to wait a long time for either the EU or the UK to bring in anti-slap legislation. So is anyone trying to argue that the courts can and should develop non-statutory anti-slap injunctions? Is, any thoughts on that, Rebecca? Is the courts is oh. is the courts where we might be going with this? Is that, you know, I'm always, I'm, as you know, very interested in, in where the role of the courts is and all these things. 
So, okay, as a non-lawyer, I won't speculate on um, aspects of, you know, court procedures. Um, I know Ian's really a, an expert on this, particularly in Ireland. And Ireland is also an interesting case example because of the, um, the very high defamation awards there as well, which we've seen um, really impact reporting on certain individuals that are certainly untouchable in Ireland. Um, and that's in a country that has a very good press freedom record, relatively speaking, on our, on our World Press Freedom Index. But what I will say is there are other things beyond legislation that we can certainly pursue. And um, like Susan, I'd say first and foremost to shed light on it. Um, something that we've been working together along with other organizations to try to do, for example, is to get it taken up as an issue in the context of safety of journalists in this country, which so far um, has not been successful. So, um, it, you know, there's this uh, National Committee for the Safety of Journalists that was launched by DCMS last year. Some of us have been involved in that, and we've kind of been raising it with them to even recognize it as that, that sort of an issue. Um, sometimes states don't see a clear role for themselves in this beyond just that sort of regulatory environment, but um, they can certainly contribute towards um, recognizing that it is a threat to safety, to press freedom in other ways, um, and helping uh, to, to strengthen the, the support that's available there. But I think there's also some steps needed from the media itself. And so I, you know, more often at RSF, we're focused on what policymakers can do. But this is an issue where I think the industry does um, have a role to play. And not just in sort of speaking out about it and calling it out in, in, in talking to others about what's happening and maybe not just quietly complying, but in supporting your own journalists, even when they're facing this because we've all worked with journalists who even if they're established, like with an established media outlet, really still feel on their own sometimes in fighting these things. Um, that to me is disappointing and I don't want to be in a position to publicly name and shame there because I don't think it's helpful, but I think it's really distasteful when journalists are winning awards and, and you know, part of that is these provocative things that they're pursuing and the, their outlets are also benefiting from it. But then if there's anything like this, it's sort of hands off, you're on your own. That not only impacts that individual, but sends a clear signal to others that like, hey, there are certain topics that are just not worth pursuing and you're on your own if you do. We have an interesting question here. It's a question I've been thinking about a lot, especially we, well, we published a story about something similar today already. You know, what's the value of investigating the reputation management companies themselves? Claire, what do you think? What's the, uh, uh, you mean, uh, what's their value in what? No, what's, what what's the value of doing journalism on the reputation management industry itself? Oh, well, I think that, yes, I think it's a huge story. And, you know, these firms, and, and I, you know, journalists are looking into it. But right now, um, they, they act with relative impunity. And they're smugly aware of how protected they are by all the conventions, all the legal conventions that, you know, they have a right to represent their client and, um, and really not to sort of ask too many questions about the client. They always act as if they're defending someone, you know, on a criminal charge. You know, whereas in fact, you know, this is civil litigation uh, where, you know, they know perfectly well they're, um, you know, they're acting in the interests of some of the most disreputable people on the planet. Um, you know, uh, and, um, you know, and yet they, 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 you know, utilize all these conventions that allow them to come after um, someone who's just trying to do the right thing in the public interest. Um, you know, they're coming after journalists who have written, you know, restrained, responsible articles. I mean, it's so dangerous to write about someone rich anyway. <laughs> you know, you really, ha you start off by being extremely careful you know, um, and yet you, while the journalist is under, you know, the, an immense cosh, these law companies, you know, act like, you know, they, they act like highwaymen um, without any fear of being caught. Um, so, so I think the first thing to do is to show them up for what they are and show them up for what they're doing. And it is a good story. And what we're, that's why I'm sitting here today. That's why I'm available to talk about this issue, because I, I and so many others, we need to call these guys out to say what they're doing and to stand up to these bullies. Uh, because that's what they are. They're making, and, and no one's restraining them. There's no, no, on no occasion do these lawyers sit down and think, oh gosh, you know, could this look really bad for our firm? Um, you know, had we better not take that million dollars from that nightclub, um, you know, king, um, you know, in, in some dirty corner of the world um, against who there are masses, uh, you know, of, of damning evidence. Um, you know, they don't hesitate. There's nothing for them to lose at the moment. And so therefore, yes, you know, we, the abused media, need to come out of the closet 
um, and take this on, I think, you know, for, in, in, you know, for the public. I was really struck when we did that actually a few months ago in Open Democracy. I wrote a piece about our own experiences and, you know, I thought long and hard before doing it. But, you know, like actually a lot of people got in touch talking about their own experiences of this, you know, and like it is like one of those things. It's like, as I say, it's almost like an amerta around it. It's a topic that people don't want to talk about. But but actually, you know, once 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 you start to break cover on it, um, I wonder, like we've talked a lot about about the UK, like is, you know, how unusual is the UK in this? You know, is there similar industries existing around the world or are, are we particularly uh, blighted by this? Um, sorry, just, Claire, you can, I'm happy to pass around the room. Well, I, I, think, I think it's part of a, a network of services that, that we in the UK are very efficient at providing. Um, you know, I cover corruption in the third world. Um, you know, how local uh, power abusers steal from their own people. They then turn to the Brits. Um, mainly, uh, we service them in so many ways. We help them channel their money. We advise them on how to invest their money. We tell them how to um, hide their money in the offshore system and how to avoid tax. Um, and we provide the PR services. We provide the counter reputation services, the attack services, and above all, you know, the legal services that we're talking about. Um, and, and one of the great strengths for a rich person dealing with a journalist anywhere in the world using British lawyers is we are world class expensive. So therefore, you know, you're you're quadrupling the expense for the person who doesn't really have very much money by taking the whole action through the UK. Um, you know, so, so we're you know, we're a concierge outfit for the super wealthy in many respects. We're also a standard setter for better or worse. And that's the thing. And not just in this area, but in our press freedom climate, in our practices in other areas beyond this too. So a lot of other countries, specifically those with historical ties to Britain, look at what is done here and what we get away with here. And that can be an excuse for even worse behaviors in many places. Yeah, I just to echo um, what Claire and Rebecca have said, when we started this project, the Unsafe Security Project last year from Policy Center, we decided to, to do a survey amongst um, investigative journalists working specifically on financial crime and corruption. And it was about all the kind of violations and threats they face, not just legal threats, but um, nevertheless, legal threats came out as uh, identified, even by those who, have, who are suffering all kinds of horrible violations. Legal threats was the thing that came out as the most challenging for them to be able to continue to do their work. And the UK was the leading uh, international source of those threats, which is almost as um, high as those coming from Europe and the US combined. Certainly the US also has, you know, reputation management, you know, laundering services, but as already been mentioned, the combination then with the UK's legal system and the sort of lack of strong public interest defence, it makes it, yeah, it's, it's, it's an unpleasant kind of cocktail, unfortunately, plus also then, of course, the, the facilitation services that, that Claire was talking about. So it really is a kind of mecca in a lot of ways uh, for this. And we have a question on the, in the Q&A from Richard Fowler asking, now, can the UK public health, you know, has apathy been a bit shaken by the pandemic, you know, and, and you know, is, is, you know, is there, is there, a, what can, what can people do? And I think I find this people, you know, it's a very good question. Like what can ordinary people do to try and counter this? I well, I think I, there's been a sort of, go ahead, Claire. Oh, so should I go? I, I think there's been a sort of, you know, journalists have been the bad people in the public mind for, for a while. Um, and I think there was one question about, you know, the big four or so institutions who run the media. The, the media has been abused, ironically, by the same sort of powerful forces, um, you know, that we're, we're, we're dealing with, really. Super rich people buying up uh, newspapers and then tr tr using them as, as a weapon, as a, you know, a, as a way of um, actually bringing down the public debate and disgracing journalism, frankly, in the process. So we've had a period of disgraceful journalism that's shocked, rightly shocked the public and given us a very bad name, which has made it hard for us to stand up and say, actually, you know, 
the most of us are quite well intentioned. Most of us are honest. Most of us are actually, you know, doing a very necessary job in society. And that the pendulum needs to come back a bit in the public mind. And I think the only way we can do it is by speaking out. And my huge thanks to people like Rebecca and Susan and their organisations for, you know, for, for, for calling this out um, and, and, and working to, 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 to inform the public uh, about the dire threat to freedom of the media. Rebecca? Um, I absolutely agree with Claire. I was going to say something similar about the public attitude towards media um, is, is not helpful when we've got trends like scum media and you know you see the behaviors towards some members of the public, for example, trying to cover anti-lockdown protests and these sorts of things. And these sentiments are being whipped up by some public officials as well. And that has to be stated. Um, that just increased this climate of risk for journalists as well. Um, so, you know, something, something uh, along the lines of, of countering that, um, that prevalence and sort of showing um, what the impact is. I think one thing that gets lost in many kind of cases of journalists that we're defending, whether it's legal threats or other types of threats, is that a lot of people lose sight of the fact that the ultimate impact is on the public. It's on the public's right to know. It's not just about the rights of individual journalists, it's about all of us. So every time somebody is targeted, every time somebody is silenced and some topic becomes you know, so risque and people become untouchable, that means that all of us have less information about that and we're less able to actually hold our own governments to account. And so that's it. And it's, you know, it's, it's very, it's a very simple concept, but one that I think people lose sight of. And, and you see this attitude sometimes that, oh, journalists, the scum media get what they deserve. Not at all. And then one other thing that I think can be helpful sometimes is just supporting individual journalist fights back. I know people end up having to do crowd funders and things like that to actually take these things to court. And so few people are willing to really fight that. Um, if you're able to donate, um, obviously all of our organizations that fight this too are, are charities and, and are glad to receive donations, but it can be really worth as well, like supporting individual crowd funders. We saw a recent case where actually the success of a fundraiser, um, seemed, one of the crowd funders, in fact, seems to have had an impact on uh, the willingness of, uh, of the complainant to continue. So that can also have a, a knock-on campaign effect as well as practical support to that journalist in their legal battle. I guess we're, we're coming towards the end. I'll just take, I will, we'll go with one last question and just quickly, and then, and then we will wrap up. And I guess there's an interesting kind of question here, almost like a, almost like a thought for me and Grant, you know, he's asking, is it, is it corporate um, rather than personal reputation laundering? As, or, you know, as, as, or what's the corporate aspect of this? I think we often can think of it just as people, you know, you think of Catherine Belton's been sued by a number of people, but there's a real corporate aspect to this too that I think also can really get hidden that it's, you know, it's not necessarily just a person who doesn't want you to find out about the, but there's, there can be a real corporate footprint to this too. Uh, Susan, do you want to speak to that? Uh, yeah. I mean, it certainly, it can be both. Um, and I think it's slightly interesting with, with corporations when you talk about libel laws, because there is a certain level of um, protection there in the fact that um, if you're if you're an organization, a company that's uh, decided to, to sue, for example, a journalist, you'd have to prove um, that there was a, a financial harm to your organization in, in order for it to sort of to stand and to succeed uh, potentially. So um, in a way, there is a kind of a little bit of a, a safety net there. And we have seen some cases be withdrawn because ultimately ultimately, um, despite whoever bringing it, um, you know, saying that they've been, their company has been libeled, actually their, their, their company hasn't suffered financially, which is quite interesting uh, in a way. And you do sometimes see companies and their directors suing at the same time. Um, and that can take a case forward um, when the company couldn't, for example, because of that um, kind of uh, caveat. But um, I, I think, I just wanted to speak a little bit to the point that sort of Rebecca was making, which is that, you know, we, first of all, be thinking about the impact on journalists, but the, the second impact, of course, is as, us as a society. And what happens when this information doesn't get out there? And some of the cases that we've also been looking at sort of historically, and you think about Harvey Weinstein, and, and you think about Jimmy Savile, and, and you think about even, you know, when it came to sort of Lance Armstrong and his um, drug scandal and, and cheating, and how long all of those cases came um, to come out. And in a way, um, you know, they were all subject to kind of legal threats, and some, some of it was tied in with non-disclosure agreements. 
But there was also a certain tide of public support and public opinion that, that changed and allowed for people to break their NDAs, for example, um, and uh, come forward. And I'd like to think that people coming out and speaking about this issue more uh, will encourage others to do so. It's great that you had such a good response, Peter, to your article on this topic from others. Um, and so hopefully if journalists do speak out more and, and other people who are affected by this issue, um, we might see that public tide of attention and support. Um, it certainly would be much needed, I think, to push forward legislative and regulatory reform. Thank you very much, Susan. And I feel like we, we're, we're coming to the end now and it does feel like that's a very very good point to end on i think it's you know at least it's a it's a hopeful note now I, I for one am always trying to look at the, the the optimistic side of it and see is there is there a space in which there can be a tide of opinion there can this can be seen as something that like people don't have to suffer the kind of experience that someone like catherine belton is suffering now i think it's really 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 important and and that you know, it's not just, it's in many ways, we, to, to borrow a, a, a euphemism somewhere else, it's not a victimless crime, this kind of libel tourism. It actually really affects ordinary people in really profound and deeply dangerous and damaging ways. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody for joining our debate. Thanks to all of these fantastic panelists and thanks to the audience uh, who've, I'm delighted to see have joined us from around the world. It's really heartening to see so many people from all over the world. And we have a weekly debate here on Open Democracy, and you can check out our website um, and social media for the details, or go to opendemocracy.net, and you can type uh, find live discussions there, and you can find all the details. And I should also say Open Democracy relies on contributions and donations to do the kind of journalism and at time to, to, to pay for the legal costs of trying to do the journalism we do. So if you want to see more of this public interest journalism, please support Open Democracy and you can support us at support.opendemocracy.net forward slash donate. Thank you all again for all of your help and for joining here and I will see you all next week.